Item 5, work session 5A, changes to the appointment policy for boards, commissions, and committees. Aubrey. Good evening. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so we are discussing some changes to the appointment policy tonight, and this is a little bit of a team effort. Um, there were um, a handful of changes to the um, to the appointment policy, and um, if y'all have questions, the other staff members who represent these other enti entities that I don't are here um, to answer any questions. So the prefer the first change was to keep Friendswood beautiful, to add two alternate members. Um, they have regular members, um, and they just don't want to change their quorum requirement, but to have two alternate members to be able to call on um, if needed to hold their meetings. Uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission, we changed our resolution several months ago to change our meetings from first and third Thursday to second and fourth Thursday. So this is just formalizing that change as well. And then um, kind of a new topic for discussion is um, our Zoning Board of Adjustment. Currently, we have five regular members and four alternate members. And um, there was a suggestion to possibly change to seven regular members and two alternate members. Um, so just a little bit of background on, oh, um, let's see. I'm gonna go over the other change and then we'll get into ZBOA a little bit more. Uh, the volunteer application on page one was to add a line with city, state, and zip. Um, page two was to remove election worker as an option to check off. And page four was replace the word may with will, since it's now required um, and added prior to appointment at the end. Will what? Um, background check. Okay, thank you. Um, so, let's see. Do y'all have any questions about Keep Friends with Beautiful for James Tony? How many there? members they have? 21? 20? Nice even. And then, um, so planning and zoning, that one's already kind of done. Um, any questions about the volunteer application? Okay, so ZBOA. Uh, currently, state law requires that the board must consist of at least five members um, appointed for two years. It says you may provide for the appointment of alternate board members and that cases must be heard by 75% of the members. So if we have a five member board, that would be a minimum of four. If we had a seven member board, that would be a minimum of five. Um, I did go look at some other cities um, just to see where you know, other cities are at. Um, the most common seems to be the five regular and four alternate. Uh, city of Plano has eight uh, regular members and two alternate, and the city of Denton has six. Uh, regular and three alternate. Um, so the Planning and Zoning Commission, this, the, these requirements are actually in the zoning ordinance, so P&Z is going to have to look into this um, and make a recommendation. So if y'all are supportive of investigating this change, then we can commission the Planning and Zoning Commission to research and make a recommendation. Um, but if y'all just want to leave it as is, I just don't want to waste Planning and Zoning Commission's time. Uh, they have other things to do, too. So um, just kind of wanted to get some feelers for some things tonight. Uh, if y'all have any questions. What, what is P&Z's recommendation? We they just leave a, it the same? We don't have a recommendation from them at this point. Okay. So that kind of leads into my question. What did bring this about in the first place to cause this to actually be on the agenda or on our work session? What, what was discussed? With respect to the Zoning Board of Adjustment, it was a, a council member's request or suggestion to look into appointing and not calling Council Member Rocky out. Over here. Uh, uh, but in regard to the attendance and the frequency of certain alternate members sitting at the dais, I believe was the, the impetus behind this. And don't I recall, ZBOA meets less than anybody. I mean, I, I, we would go years without a ZBOA meeting. Uh, they usually meet at least three or four times a year. Most recently, it was Construction Board of Adjustment that has not met in years. Oh, that's yeah. the one. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, my, my reason for recommending it is it, it was, um, 
even with five, with four alternate members, they sometimes were not being able to have meetings. So one of the things about doing this was the alternate members, some of them would be really good on the, on the whole thing. And I think what we're going to have to do is if we go to seven, which I think we should do, um, we should make it very clear that you've got to attend. You know, they get plenty of warning, weeks and weeks of advance warning. And the other thing is that when people come up in front of the Zoning Board of Appeals, it's, it's in general their last, their last chance. And, you know, it'd be nice to have a full complement of, uh, of your citizens up here hearing your case. So with seven and two alternates, I don't think they're going to have any problem getting a quorum, and they really should be looking at themselves if they're, if they're having that problem. Uh, so that was the, the reason for doing this, because the, the alternate membership was just very confusing as to who does what and when they were on and when they would get called. So, so with seven members plus two alternates needing five to establish a quorum, any of the nine count? An alternate can fill in, and, and why do we need to wait on P and Z to make it sounds like a good plan? Just, just the way our ordinance is written, it requires planning and zoning commission's input on. Okay. Uh, on the and, zoning ordinance, yeah. We'll bring. I, I have another some more um, information about ZBOA to bring up in the next section of my presentation. So. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, like nod heads, yeah. <laughs> All right. We'll look into that. Yeah, so I, I, I don't know why we would change it. I mean, that's, I don't know. Making boards bigger does not guarantee a, a more frequent quorum. It doesn't, I, I don't know that it changes anything. So, uh, I mean, doing things just for the, it's on, doing things just for the sake of doing them. I mean, and I get it, right? I mean, you, the goal or the intent is to get, get a quorum more frequently and, and I appreciate that and understand that. Uh, but I think if you volunteer to be on one of these boards or commissions that you should take that seriously and that that's, you know, a, a duty that you fulfilled. So I think changing it from five to seven doesn't change that responsibility. You don't, you know, I mean, we certainly don't have anything to hold over their head to make sure that they show up other than removing them from their position if they don't make it so many times, which I know we've talked about doing in the past on other boards. Uh, I just don't know that this does anything, so why spend the time and energy at P&Z and spend the time and energy up here? It doesn't make sense to me. That's my opinion. All right. I'll talk to P&Z, see what they say. Maybe they'll agree with John. It's the same number of members, right? It's nine members. We have five and four alternates now. We'd have seven and two. It does nine. still nine. It makes it still drive. It drives up the, the quorum number. Though. But I agree. Uh, you know, we ought to be holding these people feet to the fire. And if people are not showing up, we need to reappoint different people. Right. Yeah. Did ZBOA make this recommendation too, or just? Uh just Steve. No, they have not weighed in on this. Oh, okay. Um, yet. Have you had a meeting, Phil, since you've been appointed? No, they haven't yet. called you yet. Okay. We will be having one soon because we need a new chair and vice chair, so that's oh. on the list of things to do soon. <laughs> Better show up, Phil, or else you'll be the chairman. Don't. <laughs> the Rotary, a long time ago, if you didn't make the meetings and enough time you, you got a goat delivered to your home and I know that for a fact because I had a goat at my house and I played with it for a whole week <laughs> and had a great time when I was a little kid but um, we could always get a goat and bring it to their house and, and tell them they're going to get to keep the goat for a week <laughs> unless they show up. Any other bad ideas? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah, it's still around. Okay, so we'll then we'll, that'll just piggyback into the next portion of the um, discussion tonight is the development regulations, um, and again, just looking for input. Um, planning and zoning has to weigh in on 
missed most of this, but we're just looking for guidance and direction at this point. So another topic is ZBOA authority. Um, as far as state law, state law allows ZBOA to do administrative appeals, um, which is um, if the building, if the, not necessarily, but if one of the city staff, usually building official or city planner, make a decision that a developer or somebody doesn't necessarily agree with, they can appeal to the Zoning Board of Adjustment. Um, we've not had an administrative appeal that I can recall in the last 12 years. Um, special exceptions is another allowance by state law for ZBOA. Um, and this is the particular section of our ordinance that is very, very detailed. We go into permanent special exceptions, we go into temporary special exceptions, and there's criteria for all of those items. Um, state law doesn't have any criteria, they just say ZBOA can hear special exceptions. And so our ordinance is a lot more um, strict and um, detailed than state law. And then as far as variances, we also have a list of findings that the ZBOA has to basically check off in order to approve a variance, which again is not in state law. So our proposal is to consider making our ordinance just be consistent with state law. Um, I did look at a few other cities and basically they just copy um, what's in state law and they're not as restrictive as we are. So if that's, if nobody has any major objections to that, we can have the commission look into that as well um, and make a recommendation on that. Again, it's in the zoning ordinance, um, so PNZ has to make the recommendation. And who recommended, brought this recommendation? Um, this was brought up at, um, by staff mainly. Um, this followed a previous uh, Zoning Board of Adjustment case in which uh, a particular item had gone back and forth a couple of times and uh, uh, there were a number of opportunities for the item to be approved, but the commission didn't feel that their authority was broad enough to, to approve it. Okay. Um, and this was an, an effort to allow us to have some more flexibility from the Zoning Board of the Commission. So this, this, this would make that whole process? It would give them the opportunity to make a decision uh, that made sense um, within the parameters of state law that didn't quite fit our ordinance previously. Okay. Possibly keep us out of court because ZBOA didn't feel like they had the authority to allow something that, yeah. so they, they basically, in the particular case that we're talking about without going into details, they followed exactly what P and Z had recommended without making, you know, and P and Z obviously has some Restrictions on what they can do too. So anyway, uh, we just broaden their their ability to make allowances, if you will, to, sure. to things, and not make us have to go to court to settle these things. Because once ZBOA rules, they're sort of a they're a legislative body that we we can't overturn what ZBOA enacts votes on. So then we're sort of stuck. So if we give them more latitude, I guess, then hopefully we'll. See what I'm saying, Phil? <laughs> and, and state law does still, like for a variance, there has to be a hardship on the property. Um, but like I said, our ordinance is, has more items that they have to check off in order to approve a variance. Um, so. And so staff is okay with us expanding or reducing the, the, the requirements, it sounds like? And the answer to that is yes, and the rationale behind it is if, if the Zoning Board of Adjustment, P and Z and Council ultimately just continue to reinforce the same rule, then there's really no relief valve. When staff does its review and says it's not in compliance, then that's pretty much what ZBOA then reinforces, right. which we appreciate it from a staff perspective, but in reality there are instances in which it makes sense for the quasi-judicial board to make a recommendation that doesn't necessarily agree with staffs, but allows for a variance uh, under certain circumstances. Okay. If I'm understanding this correctly, this will be less restrictive or, or it'll be the same uh, restrictions as the state is. In other words, we're not going to be more restrictive than the state. So I think right. that's, a, I mean, I would love for PNZ to weigh in <coughs> on that one. I think that's probably a good recommendation. Right. It allows for there to be another body to make a decision that just doesn't continue to uphold the rules as written, allows for some flexibility. Good. All right. 
the next topic is uh, building codes and fire codes. Um, so we are looking at updating from the 2012 uh, to 2018 international building codes and the 2017 national electrical code. Um, these codes are, um, the international building codes are uh, published by the International Code Council. Um, they're, all the codes are updated every three years. And um, our ISO rating requires that we adopt codes within two code cycles. So being on the 2012 right now, we're gonna jump to the 18, um, just so we don't have to do this again in three years. <laughs> It'll kind of put us a little bit ahead. Um, as far as the 2018, so our building officials here tonight, he can explain um, the 2012 to 2015 um, was some cleanup, and then 2015 to 18 wasn't um, quite so bad. So he can go over those changes, and then uh, fire marshals here to kind of go over the fire code changes as well. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Brian Rowan, the building official. So for this iteration of code, this is kind of a perfect year to go ahead and jump the step to rather than going to the 15 then into the 18, just because the 15, like I said, Aubrey had said, was kind of a, a cleanup of the 12. The 12 was kind of our big step on code. Um, 18 kind of clarifies things and makes it a lot more um, enforceable. It, it uh, made it actually many of the items made it easier for the contractors. It just made it easier for code officials to understand it, made it easier for contractors to go ahead and uh, enforce and gave them far more flexibility. Um, unfortunately, um, code's a dry subject and there's not some wild, exciting things that are changing. Uh, a lot of the, the changes in the codes are um, bringing in solar is the big portion of it. Uh, I've got books that just talk about the changes in all the different codes, and I would guess that more than 60% of that is bringing in uh, new technology and solar, just updating it and providing opportunities, which we still have, are just on the cusp of it. We do start to see a lot more solar programs in, in the city, but we aren't at the point where it's a big change for the contractors that we're dealing with on that. They're, they're more on top of it than, say, a lot of others because it's so new technology anyway. So on the international code, that's the predominant one that we see on the commercial side. Can you guys oh, there we go. The residential is, is like I said, again, some dry code things that, that are coming in. Um, it does allow for some more flexibility on, on some things as far as adding um, longer cords for the dishwashers. And, and other than that, it's not anything crazy where when we went from the 9 to 12, we did start to see some, some different changes. These are just things that kind of clean up. bringing back in some of the, the old things that had dropped off, water, hammer, arresters is, like I said, nothing real exciting. And plumbing code and mechanical code are kind of in the same situation. Um, the International Energy Conservation Code is one of the codes that was the big hurdle that we ran into when we went into the 12. It was uh, very difficult to, um, for the contractors to comply with that. So we started taking the 15 code because it corrected some of the sins of the 12 code already. So a lot of our contractors are already into the 12 and starting to move into the 18 as we, we've gotten into that point. The electricians, for the most part, they stay to the latest codes. Their um, TDLR license requires them to, to be to the latest code. So most of them are already enforcing on, onto the 2017 National Electric Code. We're not breaking any new ground here. We are moving into a situation where we are able to kick the can on this ISO, so we, we aren't gonna come back in and keep changing things on the contractor. So that is our goals moving into the, the 2018. 
Any questions over building codes? I know. It's How fun. many solar inspections have you done this year? I can get you that number, but I, can, I we are at, uh, I saw three um, solar permits come in this week. So we are starting to see that technology definitely coming into the community. Um, exciting to see, and it's um, between the backup generators and solar, we are starting to see a lot of alternate sources of, of power. Obviously, when we get in these situations um, with the hurricane, and then also, I think, we're, we are embracing a more conservative nation. Thanks, Brian. Brian Mansfield. Brian Mansfield, the Fire Marshal's Office. Um, don't have a whole lot of changes. Most of them are the same ones that we've had before, some amendments. Uh, we already have, we, are, we were talking about ZBOA earlier, they already act as our uh, Board of Adjustments, so we removed that out of the code and allow that to happen. Also, the same thing with the penalties. So the other thing that we have is about sprinklers for anything that's over 11,999, so basically 12,000 square foot, whether that be commercial or residential. Uh, and then this year they added a group, a new group hazard occupancy, and they, we have also adopted a few more appendices that are allowed and uh, don't foresee any major issues or any impacts on any uh, cons current construction. Uh, um, K and H will probably be the ones that will be used the most as far as uh, the group H hazard uh, as we're doing some <clears throat> possible construction over on the Beamer side of town. And then on our life safety code, um, just uh, removing the requirements for sprinklers for single family and uh, homes. Pretty, pretty straightforward for the most part, the same as last year. Or the last 2012, not a whole lot of additions or deletions. Questions for me? All right. Thank you. So uh, we are working on the ordinance changes for that, so you'll see that again. Um, we're hoping to, uh, for that to be effective January 1st um, of next year, just to have an easy new effective date. Uh, so the next item kind of follows building codes. Um, with House Bill 2439, uh, the state changed the requirements that municipalities cannot prohibit uh, building materials or methods that are allowed by a model code for either residential or commercial structures. Um, so some proposals with this, we're going to have to amend our zoning ordinance, um, so you'll be seeing some changes um, with this. Um, there are a couple of amendment, local amendments that we have to the building code, or I think electrical code, that we're going to have to omit when we do our code change or code update because um, the state doesn't allow um, us to make those exceptions anymore. Um, the plan for the zoning ordinance, as far as our exterior building materials for commercial, um, we're, we're going to try to figure out a way to keep our preferred materials in the ordinance, um, but obviously not prohibit um, developers from um, any building materials that would be allowed by building code. I had a, a number of discussions with my uh, next my neighbor, Dr. Bonin, about this, um, and he uh, he honestly admits that when this bill came through, nobody paid much attention to it and it sailed through. Uh, and he's been told by multiple cities, not just us, that this was a really bad bill. Uh, he is sad that he would be willing to work with us and bring this bill up for and amend it in the next in the next cycle, and I think. We probably got a pretty good chance. It originated because one city in the state passed an ordinance that required a certain building material, and there was only one option, Amarillo or somebody. And that's what got this all going. Uh, so he's, uh, he's willing, and he's going to probably actually come back and work with us. Um, and I think there's other, uh, there's other state representatives, I think, that are feeling the heat on this. So my guess is it'll get amended in some fashion to be a little uh, more flexible for what we use it for uh, in the next in the next session. So that would be two years from June. 
um, before it would, could be changed. And that was kind of the intent of keeping all of our wording in there and meeting state law. But that way, hopefully, if it's changed back in two years, we can just revert back to what we already have. Right. Yeah. Yes. So I, w I was going to ask if, um, I know we have to be in compliance with the law, but can we give builders and developers our preferred Okay. Yeah, and if they if they I mean if they want to comply and agree to and the market's going to drive a lot of that. I mean, surrounding buildings, you know, you're going to want to blend in. You don't want to be, you know, the only new metal building on 518. So, I mean, that's just not the trend at this point. So, our hope is that, you know, that will continue and um, you know, that they'll blend in with our, you know, surrounding buildings already. We will definitely encourage it. <laughs> Uh, sure. oh. One more comment. Um, yes. I know League City is trying to work around this bill by putting ordinance language in that requires you, I guess, to talk to your HOA. Is that how that works? They're requiring um, property um, property owners form what's known as a property owners association or homeowners association to establish these regulations. Uh, but as uh, our illustrious city attorney has pointed out, the state law is very specific about not adopting rules that would circumvent state law. So in, in some respects, it could it could set us up for a legal challenge if, if we were to. Do I was that. just going to recommend we don't do that. Good, good. Let, let let's the, let's let our representatives do their job. So this is a. Uh, <laughs> my last one is uh, sidewalks. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so again, I'm looking for. Direction for planning and zoning. They have not weighed in on this um, yet. Um, it's kind of um, an issue that's come up recently. And um, unfortunately, ZBO, this is not a case to go to ZBOA because they can't completely waive a requirement. If they do a variance to a building height, it's, you know, increasing the building height by a certain footage. And, you know, there has to be a hardship, the shape of the lot or something. We can't just say... We can't take these cases to ZBOA and they just say, nope, you don't have to do a sidewalk. Um, so we've had some um, instances right now. We've got um, basically sidewalks are required for all new development except residential with open ditch streets. Um, so we've got infill lots and flood rebuilds um, that we require sidewalks for. These new homes are being constructed in existing neighborhoods, older neighborhoods that don't necessarily have sidewalks. There might be a sidewalk across the street, um, but not on their side of the street. Our current remedy is for them to pay into the sidewalk fund. We do have that set up. Um, the sidewalk fund is an owner pays a fee before the issuance of their certificate of occupancy. It's an average of three contractor bids. Uh, the money is then deposited into a dedicated account just for that address, and the only thing it can be spent on is sidewalk at that location. Um, after 10 years, an owner can request a refund, or the city can make a request to extend it uh, for another 10 years. Yeah, I don't like that idea at all. I think that's a horrible idea. We have people that are trying to rebuild their houses and get back in their homes. They've been flooded out. They've done everything that the city's requested them to do. They've built their house up. They've got houses on either side of them that are four feet lower than they are with no sidewalks whatsoever, and you're asking them to fill, build a 90-foot sidewalk. You're not going to give them a certificate deposit until they do so. That's holding over their heads. I think that's a horrible thing that the city's doing. I've had calls on it, and I know some other people have had calls on it, but that's just not right. Those people should have, get a certificate of deposit. They've done everything the city has done, told them to do, and then we're saying, no, no, now you've got to build a 90-foot sidewalk out in front of your yard, and nobody on that side, uh, all the way down that way and all the way down that way, has a sidewalk in front of their yard. And, and so I'm not going to shoot the messenger or anything, but, uh, <laughs> but I, 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 I'm in 100% agreement, and I think it's very simple. Your property is grandfathered in. If you're the owner of the property, the property ownership's not changing hands. You're rebuilding because you had a natural disaster to your home. It would be idiotic for this government body to require you to either build a sidewalk or pay into a fund. 
And staff doesn't disagree. And the cases but, that have been mentioned, uh, and I didn't think that you did. No, and that, but that's why Aubrey's here before you this evening. We've been able to work with those homeowners to to get them where they need to be without providing a sidewalk. The difficulty is, is we're circumventing city ordinance. So this right. is before you this evening, so that we can. We're asking y'all to recommend to change the city ordinance. Yeah, so, so grandfathering. You see the direction that we're going in with yeah. regards to this. Thank you for bringing that forward, yes. staff. Yeah. Thanks for doing that. Yeah, I, yeah. I agree. The, but I believe we focused on just the homes that are being rebuilt after Harvey. That picture right there, that's not the situation with that house. So there's one piece of this. This is for the folks who are trying to get back into their homes, and I totally agree. We should not put any more... Uh, requirements on them but when it's new construction where they've torn down a home they're building a new home it has nothing to do with the flood then I assume there's a different recommendation for that um I don't have a recommendation and I don't really have a solution at this point um my initial thinking is that if your block doesn't have sidewalks that you don't have to put inside and I think it's that simple I don't we gotta figure why, out why do we why why, why why should it be that confusing if you live on a street that doesn't have sidewalks, we're not going to require you to build a sidewalk just because you knock your house down and rebuild it. And we've got people that are coming in, they're wanting to buy these houses, redo them, get them back in shape. The sure. next thing you know, they, they might want to flip that house. They are flippers. Well, that gets that house back in good construction. It gets it back on the market, and it gets it back paying taxes to this place. Why would we want to put up some kind of barrier or block them from trying to do what – Everybody wants them to do get these houses back up and in great shape and back on the tax rolls. I I don't I agree. You're not supposed. To I think it's just common just because it's new construction. We're not going to go out there. Oh, you're new. You tore that one down and built it back up. We yeah, want yeah, you yeah. to build new new sites. I think it's just common sense. I think I think for every developer that comes in and wants to develop property, it, it, you know whether it's Avalon or whoever else, then yeah, they have to meet current requirements. Anybody that's in an existing neighborhood or an existing house can keep it the way that it's been for the last 123 years or whatever. Yeah, but but this but this house is on a street where two other houses have been torn down and new houses are bu building up. So if you said put the money in the fund because it's quite conceivable on this street that all of those houses will be gone in a couple of years and then you would use the sidewalk fund to put a sidewalk in. But why would we tax people that way? That doesn't make any sense to me. But we have people all the time complaining that we don't have sidewalks. So the whole point of this was to... I'm not No, no, no. Just let me finish. Yeah, please do. I'm not arguing the contention that you guys said earlier. If you're on a street and you're the guy, you know, and you rebuild from your from your previous property and nobody else has sidewalks and nobody else is rebuilding, fine, leave them alone. I'm, I'm with you on that. But I'm just telling you, there is an a area in between that we need to define, and this is a perfect example of one. That whole street's going to get torn down and big houses are going to get put on it, and, and there won't be a sidewalk. I don't think that we should hold the, the homeowner or the property owner hostage by requiring them to do something that's not already there. It doesn't make sense. Like we were going to make Boatwright uh, Marine – Dickinson Bayou, at the very end of this town, pay into a sidewalk fund at one time. Now, I don't think that he did because common sense prevailed, but this is the kind of out-of-control stuff that we need to eliminate. And so if ever, let's just say, for example, the heart of the downtown, the older homes, for all those people that are building new homes, buying the property, tearing them down, rebuilding beautiful homes there, you sh we, I, am thankful as a city government that the property value increases like tenfold. That's enough. I'm not going to, you know, the taxable value on that piece of property goes from 70000 to half a million. They're paying enough in taxes. And then we're going to come back and say, well, if you're not required to pay, put a sidewalk in, then we're going to make you pay into a fund because somewhere down the line, 15 or 20 years from now, we'll have enough money to put a sidewalk in in your whole subdivision. That doesn't make any sense. If you live in an area that doesn't have sidewalks, you shouldn't be required to have a sidewalk put in or to pay into a fund. It just seems like it, it, it's, it doesn't seem that complicated to me. 
I would just like to throw out there that Steve's hitting on a point that is, I think we need to consider this area right here is actually a transition. You've got business on one side, you've got residential on the other. And this area actually backs up to the old junior high as well, which we talked about sidewalks to schools, which I realize it's not an active campus necessarily. But I think there may be some areas of town where we may need to evaluate whether or not a sidewalk would be beneficial. And granted, there may not be a sidewalk there now, so the fund would make sense. But I think there are going to be some situations where I don't think this is black and white, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I think there's some areas that are transitional that we might need to take a look. Does it make sense or does it not make sense? Okay, so again, to be clear, and we, we may just agree to disagree. My point is, is if it's a single family residential property and it does not have a sidewalk, the government should not require them to put in a sidewalk because there are some members in the community that want sidewalks. If that's the case, go to the voters for a bond and demand that you're going to put sidewalks in in every neighborhood that you want a sidewalk in and let them vote on it. I think it's, I think it's ridiculous that we would go into single family residentials and say, well, we think it's a good idea because we heard from the, at the Rotary Club meeting that we need sidewalks. So we're going to make you pay into a fund so that we can put sidewalks in one day. That's the worst kind of government overreach that, that I've heard since we've been up here. And why is that logic any different from a new builder coming in? Because it's a development. It is blank property. It, they are building a residential development. But they're putting in new homes with new values. They, they meet well, all the, all, every bit of your argument. No, you're talking about taking an existing residential lot and requiring them to do something different. We've had this argument. I, I don't know if you were on council at the time, but we had the argument with the, with the building codes, right? That if you add it on to a building, so let's say, for example, you have a metal building downtown, right? And it's 10,000 square, I don't know, 5,000 square feet warehouse, and you wanted to add 2,500 feet of office, that the whole entire metal building had to come down and be up to code. That was actually an argument when I got on council eight years ago, nine years ago. And we said, no, why would we do that to the, the individual and punish him for improving his property? It didn't make sense. Well, this seems very similar, in my opinion. Now, some of these, to Steve's point, are going to be safety issues down, down the road, I guess, through these transitions. Will those be further evaluated by another, I mean, is that going to be a committee evaluation? Uh, Something that'll evaluate. I mean, I see there's a sidewalk across the street on this one. Did that person put that in voluntarily, or so that sidewalk was installed back when the sub, that particular roadway was built and then rebuilt. It was maintained. Um, what I would suggest is the impetus for this originally was the flooded homes that were torn down and rebuilt, and it didn't make sense putting in a sidewalk that didn't connect anything. Um, obviously, there's multiple opinions on council. Let us run this through PNZ and bring a recommendation to you. We're wholeheartedly agreed from staff's perspective. We don't want to force a home that was torn down because of Harvey and rebuilt to put in a sidewalk to nowhere. Maybe give some options for consideration that may meet everybody's opinion up here. I'm saying that somewhat tongue in cheek. That I don't know how likely that is, um, but I think we're you know we're we're all in agreement on on two ends of this argument. You know the the Avalon. You guys are going to put sidewalks in the uh, the home that was destroyed or rebuilt because of Harvey, there was no sidewalk there before. We're not going to come in and say, oh, we're sorry, your house was flooded and you got to rebuild. Now you got to put a sidewalk in on top of it somewhere in the middle ground where, you know, the gentrification of a neighborhood where people are coming in, buying maybe multiple lots, putting up big, big homes. Well, there's some, you know, we probably need to discuss that a little more and uh, figure out where we can agree on that one. But I think both ends, that you know, the, we're in agreement and then well I know there wasn't a sidewalk over to the high school and this was a high priority of our honorable mayor and I'm just uh, thrilled to death with what turned out over there but that was something an incentive that he took upon himself and moved the entire city saying hey this is a safety matter like Brent was mentioning let's put these sidewalks to the high school and and it was paid for not by the homeowners that was paid for by us and it's, it's a great it's a, the kids can walk down to school without being in the road so th that can happen in every one of these situations where you might look at this and down the road, Steve Rocky might go, you know, this is a safety issue. 
I think the city ought to put that in, and then we can agree to it or not agree to it. But And I would agree with that. But when you sit there and say, okay, you got to rebuild this, and when you do, you're going to have to and put if in. if you don't thing. have a sidewalk in, you can't move back into your house. Yeah. I mean, so, so to use a very extreme example, so the big white house on 528 got burned down. So we're going to tell the big white house on 528 that when you rebuild, you got to build a sidewalk on 528. The, the, that's a ditch. The current code, that's an open ditch, though. So they wouldn't no, be I know required. That. But I yes. know that. But if you're going to make these example. guys do it, that was an extreme example. If you're going to make these guys do it, then, you know, what's next? No open ditches, and we're going to start putting, making those people put in sidewalks? I mean. Well, and I will correct. add, the Planning and Zoning Commission is passionate about sidewalks as well. Um, and, for instance, the Vergata Commons development, they stood there, they requested to pay into the sidewalk fund, and the commission said no. You know, we need sidewalks. And so they figured out a way, and, you know, we're getting sidewalks over there. So um, I think the commission, I think they have, you know, good thoughts. I, um, we'll pass on your um, thoughts, and we'll see if we can get a good recommendation for you. And just for the viewing public, no homeowners have been kept from moving into their home. So I understand this is a concern. We need to figure out a solution. But everybody that's built a house has been allowed to move into it. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, capital project update. I would like to reintroduce council to uh, our new director of engineering and city engineer, Hill Arias. He is here this evening to give you all his first capital improvements report. Y'all seem feisty tonight, so good luck, Hill. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a uh, Price is Right contestant coming down all the way, taking the long way over here. Come on down. <laughs> um, Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. I'm here to give you the brief, uh, brief update to our capital improvement projects that we have the ongoing at, at the city right now. Uh, if at any point you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me. Technology. Yeah. There it goes. Okay, the, uh, the first thing I wanted to share with you guys is the completion of the construction of the restrooms and the pavilion at Old City Park. Uh, city staff conducted a final walkthrough on September 24th, at which time we uh, determined that the project was substantially complete. Uh, the city's park and recreation department has uh, now taken this project and um, taking it from here, they've added some signs and uh, they're stocking it up and uh, get, making it user friendly. Um, and I did want to mention also that the uh, acceptance of the uh, improvements and the uh, initiation of the one year maintenance bond uh, is part of tonight's consent agenda. Next, we have the uh, ongoing construction of Blackhawk Boulevard Phase 2. Uh, to date, the city has spent $2.8 million on the uh, construction of this project, uh, and it's a uh, $4.5 million uh, project. As of last month, we were uh, sitting at 62% done with the project. Uh, we're actually having a progress meeting tomorrow with the contractor, and they're going to give us some, some updated numbers on that. Uh, so it will be a little bit more than 62%. Um, they were rocking along in the uh, weeks leading up to uh, trop Tropical Storm Imelda. And uh, due to that storm, it put them back about a week. But since then, they've uh, gotten back into the groove of things, and they're, they're moving along pretty quick. Uh, their goal moving forward is to pour concrete every day, if possible. And uh, we will be getting, along with the uh, uh, completion percentage, uh, we will be getting an updated schedule from the guys. And uh, it'll give us a good indication as to when we might be able to expect the uh, project to be wrapped up. But right now, I'm, I'm saying probably going to be in the uh, first quarter of next year. And now the uh, 
2018 storm sewer cleaning and inspection project. Uh, when I came here, this project had a stop work order in place. Uh, stop work order was issued back in April because of some confusion on the uh, scope of the work. Uh, since then, and in uh, recent weeks, uh, both city engineering staff and uh, public work staff uh, have met with um, each other and with uh, the city attorney uh, because we're trying to uh, see where there's a breakdown in communication here uh, where we got to $674,000 expended on this project and the contract is for six ninety six, and we still have some streets left out there. So <clears throat> in meeting with them, it became evident that uh, there were issues with the, uh, the specs, the way it was written, and it, it lended, it um, gave the uh, contractor uh, the opportunity to do extra work because it was not clear that, it, uh, that the, uh, of what the scope of the work was gonna be. Um, where we stand today, uh, as you can see, we've spent about 675,000, and uh, this was supposed to be a $696,000 project. Uh, yes? Um, it was supposed to be a $696,335 project, and that was to do the entire job of uh, storm sewer cleaning and inspection. We spent six hundred and seventy-four thousand five ninety-seven. How much have we gotten completed to the original contract? What we thought we were going to do is be completed with six ninety-six. We're at six seventy-four. How much have we done, and how much have we not done? Um, <clears throat> of the original intended scope, uh, it was about one hundred ninety-four thousand dollars worth of work. So, there's a significant. Uh, amount of work that was outside of the scope. Did we agree to? So we're right Not now. real clear on that. So short of um, speaking ill of any previous employees, uh, we've had some issues that they had approved certain line items, to things related to this contract that had left the project incomplete, but uh, approved the contractor to do more more work than we intended. So, so, so we originally had $196,000 of work done, uh, no. contracted for, but they billed us $674,000. No, the original contract was for the six ninety six. So we didn't have $194,000 for this project, and we've expended six seventy four. dollars Okay. The total project cost was $700,000 from the get-go. Okay. The concern is that the contractor did work outside the scope of what was originally intended, doing ad alternate items that uh, were things that were helpful but not necessarily um, a requirement. And so, correct. And so what we're doing right now is we're going back with the contractor to try to rectify some of these things. Um, it's unfortunate we've corrected the mistake on our end, but we're still trying to, to work with the contractor to get what we initially wanted done and need done completed. What percentage of the work that we initially wanted done has been completed, regardless of the cost? Uh, of the uh, work that we wanted done uh, that's been completed, it's a little over uh, 50 percent, uh, between 50 and 55 percent. We can work out an agreement, and we're in the process of doing so with the contractor to maybe make this a multi-year uh, approach to get everything completed. Uh, unfortunately, this was a effort that's done uh, after Tropical Storm Harvey, and it hadn't been done on a routine basis, n n not to the degree that we did following Harvey. My recommendation with council, much like everything else, is that we do this on a five-year cycle continually, that this is not a situation that the, the storm sewers are left without it being jetted out and cleaned of any silt or debris that builds up over time uh, until the next storm, but that it's done routinely. So. I did want to add also, Excuse me, though, excuse uh, me. Yes. the change orders. You, 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 the sec extra work was done with change orders, right? Correct. And how much were the change orders for, I mean, individually? Were there several of them, or was there just one? Or It was authorization by staff uh, that wasn't an official change order, but authorized the contractor to do some additional work. So uh, it's not broken. Change orders, or was it one? It was multiple correspondences, but it wasn't an official change order. 
So of the work that's been done, was it all needed to be done? Is it, that what I'm hearing? That it was needed to be done, but not to the extent uh, to supplant a previous item, a previous street or two that we needed to get completed. So it wasn't as important as what we wanted to get completed. Um, We've corrected the issue with staffing. We have a whole new department associated with this, and we've put some new players in place to, to monitor these things so that we don't have a similar issue reoccur. Um, but as Hill gets started, he's coming across some of these things and, that we're And this was with. something that, um, you know, I came in and I, I immediately realized, man, this is going to be an uh, uncomfortable fix here. Um, uh, what kind of mess did I inherit here? Um, but the... Uh, Contractor has been um, good here in the recent past couple of days to um, communicate with us. And uh, something that we've done is uh, we have sent to them a request for a cost proposal. This re request contains in it the streets that were had not been done that were in the uh, original scope. And not only that, we gave them quantities so that we can get a, a good, accurate uh, number back. Uh, previously, they didn't really, they didn't have quantities. They had streets, is what they had. Uh, so so, so in, my, in, in my opinion, it's a hard stop at 696. Correct. And you bring, you guys bring any additional requests back to us. And that's what we're doing. Okay. With the, with the solution on how to fund it and how to make it fit the budget. Okay. Correct. I guess at that point we'll prioritize what needs to be done and how to go out and figure Correct. out where the money's going to come from. And this contract was intended to be a once and once and done finite uh, work activity. My recommendation is for it not to be a once and done, and that it's done systematically on a continual cycle, just like you would go cut a ditch. Okay. Moving on to our 2018-2019 street maintenance program. Uh, the uh, project program itself is in the uh, final stages, uh, get near, getting near uh, completion. Uh, we're currently waiting for the contractor to return and complete the rest of uh, Wilderness Trail, uh, which was not done previously because there's some, as I understand it, some home construction going on and it didn't make sense to um, lay down fresh asphalt and uh, have a whole bunch of trucks driving down that road. So um, we've got a few minor details left, uh, such as the installation of uh, loop detectors at some traffic lights and addressing some concerns that uh, several citizens have expressed in the uh, transition from the new asphalt to their driveways. So we're going to address that also. Um, finally, the one thing that we hope we can get, get to do um, is there may be, after all is said and done, there may be a uh, enough money left to repave uh, Diamond Lane. Um, Diamond Lane is on FM 2351 between uh, Mary's Creek and Clear Creek. It's a cul-de-sac asphalt, half the asphalt is gone. And uh, so the uh, residents there have uh, um, come to pay those visits uh, frequently and uh, um, reminding us that, hey, we, we help us out. Uh, well, this, is, this may be a solution here if we have enough money uh, left to go uh, finish uh, Diamond Lane. And uh, if it doesn't happen this year, then uh, it'll be a priority next year in the uh, Next. And Hill's following the pavement management plan recommendation, so Diamond Lane was already on the, on the slate to be completed. Um, Can I ask a quick question? Uh, Mo, you know this better Spreading probably. Oaks. West Spreading Oaks. Yes. Yeah, is that one done, or are they going to do something to clean it up? They're further? supposed to come back and redo that, that roadway to address some of the anomalies associated with it. Thanks. Okay, on to our 2019-2020 uh, street maintenance program. Uh, our projects coordinator, Bria Whitmire, and uh, she's sitting in the back, back there. Uh, um, 
I didn't tell her that I was going to uh, call her out, but um, she's a uh, licensed engineer uh, like myself. Uh, between she and I, uh, we're working on the specifications for this project and um, getting the ground running. Uh, she's using the IMS uh, uh, report that the city has previously gotten and uh, going through that and then um, seeing where all uh, repairs need to be made. And in the meantime, I'm going through the uh, specifications, reading it line by line and uh, making sure that what it, what it says in there um, meets state law starting early in uh, 2020, if weather allows. The next capital improvement project we have coming up is the rehab and remediation of lift station number 23. This is a lift station that is located at the intersection of FM uh, 518 and Oak Drive. The project will address several issues that have been ongoing with the lift station itself. The most noticeable issue is how hydrogen sulfide has taken a toll on the facility. The interior of the wet well has a significant amount of pitting and due to the uh, due to a large amount of inflow and infiltration uh, that this lift station receives, uh, it can get backed up at times, especially after a, a heavy rainstorm. So this project will address these issues and more. The estimated construction cost is $4 million. The design consultant will be submitting the final plans to the city this Thursday, and we plan on having a bid opening on November the 14th and with the hopes of uh, awarding that bid in December. Finally, I wanted to share with you guys some of the uh, drainage advocacy efforts that have been, uh, we've been undertaking in the uh, past recent weeks. Uh, on the screen, you'll see a list of entities with whom the city has met to discuss drainage issues from small to big. The city has been represented by some combination of uh, Murad, uh, Stephen, myself, and Renee at some of these uh, meetings here. As you can see, we've been pretty busy, but we're not gonna slow down now. We will continue our efforts to uh, represent the city and get as much information we possibly can and do anything we can do now to ensure that the city of Friendswood, when it comes time for something to happen, we'll be uh, uh, up there at the front of the line. And finally, um, I w wanted to uh, make a note to you guys. Uh, we do have the job opening uh, posted for a deputy director of engineering and projects. And we've been pretty upfront with um, indicating that we're looking for somebody with a good background in hydrology and um, hydraulics. And so this person's gonna be our, our drainage guru. Uh, it's been posted for a, a couple weeks now. It's gonna be closing later on this week. And uh, after that, we'll have our interviews lined up. Uh, we've got some, looks like we're, uh, we've got some good candidates out there. And uh, looking forward to getting this filled. So, are there any questions? No, oh, thanks, Hill. Thank you. Good job.